All right, everyone, we're back. Um, today is episode four of the Under the Scope podcast. Today, I am joined by Dr. Andrea Martin, who is an inorganic chemist who got her PhD from the University of Delaware. Um, how long have you been working here at Widener for? Uh, almost, uh, almost 20 years now. She's been working at Widener University for almost 20 years, but before that, she also spent 20 years in professional um, industry, chemical industry. Um, she has research interests uh, in birds and oil spills. She's one of the advisors for Tyler Apple, who I had on episode three, as well as transition metal, uh, transition metal research. But today, I want to start with this, Dr. Martin. I want to start with your journey through chemistry, because I know, as we were talking beforehand, you started as actually a biology major. And so I wonder if we can enlighten on um, your transition from uh, biology to chemistry and where your passion for chemistry began. Sure. So I, uh, my parents are actually both chemists and both have graduate degrees in chemistry and they met working for the chemical company that I actually ended up working for eventually. Uh, so you might, everybody might think that, oh, well, you would, were going to be a chemist from day one. And I really didn't think so. When I was in high school, I read Silent Spring by Rachel Carson and the whole question of DDT and the environment and killing birds and so forth um, really resonated with me um, on a really personal note because my grandfather was a pioneering nature photographer in New England who had taken pictures of peregrine falcon nests on cliffs um, back at the time that they were just starting to, to become rare and, and almost became extinct. And so I, and in high school, I got this idea that I was going to save the environment and I was gonna become an ecologist uh, an environmental scientist. And so I went off to her sinus as a biology major and almost every other bio major in my class was pre-med. And I wasn't really that prepared for college or for the cutthroat environment of 73 pre-med majors and two non-pre-med bio majors or whatever it was. Um, and so in the middle of my sophomore year, I found myself crying in the department chair's office of chemistry saying, can I change my major to chemistry? <laughs> I'm only getting a C in organic, but will you take me anyway? And they did. That's awesome. So it's interesting because I mean, biology. So let's start with this. So I'll, I'll, sh I'll shift away from that. So when you're going through graduate school, how come you, you picked an um, inorganic chemistry? Like why was that your passion? So there's so actually, real quick, real quick, I'm sorry. Yeah. What is organic, inorganic chemistry for those who don't? Good question. So, you know, organic chemistry is kind of easier to define because it's like the chemistry of carbon as it relates to life. So, um, and then inorganic chemistry is like, you know, all the other elements. Uh, and so it's, it's a really varied field. We have transition metals, which I'm most interested in, but there are the, um, the main group metals. We have things like batteries and, and semiconductors and uh, material science. So there's, there's an awful lot in inorganic chemistry and there's bio inorganic chemistry, which is sort of the way that I got interested. Um, but I had a professor in college and uh, it was the only woman on the staff and she taught inorganic and analytical chemistry. And I loved her and I loved her courses. And so um, uh, when I got out of college and decided I was going to go to graduate school it was a time when jobs weren't that easy to find anyway. We're sort of in a recession at that point, uh, but I kind of had in the back of my mind graduate school. And so I thought, yeah, you know, I think inorganic or analytical. And I kind of went with an open mind and then met my advisor at the University of Delaware and like, oh, this is really cool work. I want to do that. So that's okay. awesome. So what, what was like what some of your favorite moments as a graduate student? Like, what, what do you remember? Like, it's like, it's like, yeah, man, when I'm going to graduate school, this is one of my favorite things that we did. Well, you know, so first of all, if I didn't say the first thing was that I met my husband in graduate school, he would probably not be too happy about that. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, when I look back in graduate school, um, one, of the, one of the best, the best things we did was that we would go out drinking to the Deer Park in Newark on Thursday nights with some of the professors. And we would sit around the bar, literally drink beer and draw chemistry on napkins. I'm not kidding. Wow. And, um, and it was, it was great. It was just, it was a, a time like where you, big ideas, you know, like great ideas were being discussed. And of course, a little bit of beer probably didn't, didn't hurt either. So. Hey, a little, listen, a little bit of alcohol. I don't think it opens you up a little bit. I think you're, I think a little, not, not too much of it goes, doesn't hurt. You know, it kind of opens up your brain um, in ways you're not 
you know, you haven't thought before. But that's really interesting because I, I, I actually haven't heard that story yet. And um, <laughs> man, how times have changed. Man, I would love to do that with you guys. I think it'd be so cool. Um, yeah, it doesn't happen at the undergraduate level that much, right? That That's just not, you know, that isn't the case. But uh, yeah, it's really just it's one of the fun things really is. Okay, so transitioning to your professional career, right? So you spent about 20 years um, doing chemical industry. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, like what exactly, maybe you held, did you hold multiple jobs? Maybe you held, or what was one your prominent job that you did? Uh, you know, I transitioned through lots of things. And so it was actually kind of cool. Uh, I started out in research and it was um, not related to my graduate work really, but it was catalysis of a polymerization reaction. And so I had to learn a lot about polymerization and I had to learn about working with chemical engineers for scaling up. And um, I got to go to plants and see them making, injecting snowmobile hoods out of our stuff using my catalyst, which was kind of exciting. And I ended up getting five patents for uh, the catalyst work. Um, and so I did that for a while and it was, and, and sort of progressed a little bit up the, up the ladder in terms of where you are as a scientist. And, um, then the company decided that they weren't going to make any money at this business. Uh, first, we had a big patent fight with another company, and I ended up spending days having depositions. I had a thousand pages of transcript testimony. We hired an expert outside witness. I spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C., going back and forth to our big law firm down there. Um, I got to work with a future Nobel Prize winner, Bob Grubbs, oh, wow. who was our expert witness from Caltech. And... Um, and it was really, that was really cool. But then we got, and I got to go to Europe, to the European Patent Office to testify there. Then we got rid of that whole business. And um, I kind of fumbled around a little bit in, in, in like blue sky research, which really wasn't for me. And then I got into more technical service and I got into paper chemicals mm -hmm. and I worked on um, treating paper so it'd be more printable with inkjets. So I got to go to lots of paper mills, which was really cool. And then I transitioned into sales at the, towards the end of my career. So the last, so eight years or so of my career, I was in sales. First it was inside sales, handling small customers over the phone. And then it was having a sales tour territory from, um, I was from Maine to Minnesota, to Iowa, to Virginia. And so I was on the road a lot. Wow. Um, and I learned about um, making fingernail polish and furniture lacquer and, um, Oh, I got to see all kinds of crazy things there when I go to customers. Uh, and then um, they got out of that business. And that's the point where I decided I was going to leave industry. They said, well, you can sell construction thickeners. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm traveling too much. I, I think it's time to try something else. And so I took the plunge and I just quit. <laughs> so is there anything in chemistry you haven't done yet in your industry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Quite that's a bit, quite a bit. But I will say that my time in the industry was really great. And I think that, um, you know, I had to learn a lot of things that I would never have learned any other way. You know, I didn't learn anything about polymer chemistry in undergraduate or graduate school, mm. but there's a lot about polymer chemistry out in, in the real world. I learned about a little bit about toxicology and, and stuff. So, um, and then getting, to, going out to plants. I mean, so I can see the appeal for chemical engineers too. That's where things happen. That's where things get made, right? And and so it's, it's really kind of exciting. And going to a paper mill is kind of scary and super exciting all at the same time because paper's coming out of the machine at up to a mile a minute and it's huge and loud and you have to wear a hard hat and safety shoes. And, you know, so um, there's so much cool stuff in chemistry, but there's so much cool stuff I haven't even started to scratch the surface on. That's the great thing about chemistry. Yeah, I think, no, I agree. I think, um, you know, you said it best. It's, there's so many different avenues that you can go in, right? So um, and, and we were talking beforehand, so now I want to get into the good stuff, right? I know you said you had a little story for me about your little story of um, transitioning from the professional or the chemical industry to teaching, right? So you spend 20 years and then all of a sudden, you know what, screw it, I'm going to go teach. So take me through that process. Yeah, well, that's not exactly how it happened. Um, so I quit industry and, and a friend of mine, somebody I, I sort of knew, her brother and my brother were friends, sort of a peripheral thing, but... Um, she had a technical writing company and she needed somebody to do sales. And I'm like, okay. Um, you know, I wanted a more flexible schedule. I was tired of traveling. And so she's like, yeah, okay, we'll give you the schedule and, um, you know, I'll pay you X and, and you can come and, and sell for me. Well, 
it turns out we didn't see eye to eye at all on how, you know, it was her company, a very small company. And I thought I knew how sales needed to happen. And she had her idea about how sales needed to happen. And short answer is I got fired. Um, and so I'm like, well, heck, <laughs> you know, what am I going to do now? <laughs> but in the back of my mind, I'd always, you know, even in, in undergraduate school, I'd sort of seen myself as maybe taking the path of my beloved inorganic and analytical teacher. And I think I channel her right now all the time. Um, so I, um, I really didn't have that plan, but I was, I was in the American Chemical Society and I was on the audit committee. And the other member of the audit committee was the chair of the chemistry department at Dell Tech in Stanton, Delaware. Mm. And we're in December, we're going through this shoebox full of stuff, trying to sort out a mess from the treasure. Mm. And she says, I need somebody to teach organic and biochemistry to the nurses starting in January, would you do it? And I'm like, organic and biochemistry, that's not my field, I can't do this. And she said, yes, you can. So she hired me and I did it and I loved it. And then I started teaching back at the University of Delaware where I was, had been a graduate student um, as, as an adjunct. And um, I, was, I actually filled in in lecture for one of the professors teaching nurses and he was the uh, associate chair of the department. He got a call from the chair at Widener saying, do you have anybody who could teach over the summer? And he said, yeah, I recommend Andy. And I went up and met with Dr. Thornton and got hired like on the spot and the rest is history. Here I am. Wow. That, dude, yep. that, is, that is an incredible story. What do you think? Um, so being here at Widener, what do you think is your biggest gratification like being a professor here at Widener University? Oh, you know, it's, it's all about the students. And if, if you ask any faculty member, it's all about the students. It is, uh, you know, I can be having a bad day and go into the classroom and it turns my day around completely. Um, it is so much fun to help students discover what they're passionate about and to give them opportunities to learn and grow. And, uh, you know, and the research part of it, of course, is really great. But it's just um, working with the students is, is just amazing. And, um, you know, I certainly don't get the same level of pay I used to get when I was in industry, but the job satisfaction is light years ahead. So I think that's, I, I think that's really admirable because I think, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of students, they like deflect from chemistry and like, they don't really, they don't really enjoy it. Um, but I think, I, I think there's, they're missing something. And I think that it, like you said, I mean, you know, you started as a biology major and then like your professors and like, kind of guided you to get to where you are now. So, you know, what do you say to those kind of students where it's like, just, you just say, keep giving it a try or like, how do you, how do you handle those kind of students who are like, ah, chemistry is just not really for me. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I do channel back to myself when a student comes into my office in tears because they're struggling. I'm like, I've been there, you know, that I, I, I totally get it. And it is going to be all right. You know, you can get a D in calculus and survive. I did. Right. So, so, I, you know, I, I certainly feel a sense of empathy. Um, and I really had to learn how to be a student. I was, I had done so well in high school and college was really hard. I did not know how to challenge myself or test myself. I went to class, it sounded easy, right? A good teacher makes it sound really easy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't know how to practice. And so, um, you know, what I, what I tell students is, yeah, if it isn't working now, we're going to try to find a different way. You know, it, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It's just that what you're doing right now isn't helping you learn. So let's, let's try to figure out a different plan. Um, and I really believe that um, chemistry is accessible, but it sometimes takes a different approach. That's all. Mm -hmm. So I want to, I want to transition now into like your research interests, because I think that ties into huge amounts of what's going on in lecture. Um, and honestly, it's just something that you're interested in personally. Um, I want to focus on the detergents and the um, the feathers because I know that's 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 you. I mean, if you had to encompass everything that you've done in your entire life, you know, from birding to ecology to involving chemistry, this is at the this is the pinnacle of it, right? So I, I spoke to Tyler. Essentially, what you're doing is you're dipping um, you're dipping feathers, bird feathers, into vegetable oil and crude oil. Correct, and then you're you're taking a blind detergent. You're taking random detergents that you don't even know what they are, and seeing how well it can clean it. Mm -hmm. So, maybe what I want to ask you is: so, how did this research project come about, and where? What is the current phase of that right now? Sure. So, um, you know, this is another one of those things where if you just happen to be at the right place at the right time, something falls together. Um, 
we're working with a group called Tri-State Bird Rescue and Research in New York, Delaware, and they have been the leaders in cleaning bills, birds affected by oil spills for, you know, decades. And they were working with DuPont, who came up with a protocol for testing the efficiency of detergents, different detergents on cleaning feathers. And so they've been using this protocol, and a lot of people know Dawn was the detergent that they originally found to be the best. And um, so they gave a presentation, their, their research veterinarian, Dr. Erica Miller, gave a presentation for the American Chemical Society uh, last October, and just about a year ago, and Dr. Mitchell and I went, and she was saying, well, DuPont has split up into a bunch of companies. The guy who was doing this work, work retired. We went, worked with this other small company in Newark and they're out of business now and they didn't actually follow our protocols. So we don't have anything meaningful results. And Dr. Mish and I looked at each other and said, hey, we could do that at Widener. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is awesome. You know, I'm just going to get out of my, my transition metal research and I'm going to move right into this. So we're trying to reproduce the protocols that they had published. We've been having some difficulty. Um, I'm on sabbatical in the spring, so I'm looking forward to, you know, we need to validate the protocol, and if we need to improve it, we need to improve it. Um, detergents have changed formulations so much uh, that we even need to test things like what percent detergent solution should they make, because detergents are more concentrated now. So uh, we actually have snow goose feathers that Tri-State has given us, and so we do actually get feathers dirty and then try to clean them. Uh, but this is branching out into a bunch of, of really interesting uh, directions. Like we can put feathers in the infrared and we can actually see oil on the feathers, which we didn't even think you'd be able to do. So um, we're just, just now getting started. It's really exciting. I, I'm excited too. So what I'm going to do is um, part of the video, I'm going to link the article that Widener produced. Um, it's, it's called... Um, um, a bird's eye view of summer research. I'm going to link that article down in the description below of the, of the channel. So if you would like to um, see some more background and see exactly what the research group is doing, you can go ahead and read that article. Um, I want to jump back to your other uh, research topics, though, because I know you do research um, with transition metal complexes yep. um, that contain um, micro microcellular molecular framework. I want to bring this up because it, it involves a little bit more inorganic chemistry and I kind of want to see, I want to show our viewers exactly what we're talking about here. So do you mind just sharing a little bit of what your previous research was and how um, inorganic chemistry is applicable here? Yes, yeah, so um, my previous research, and I'm still doing it some too, um, is based actually off of my graduate work, which really didn't get picked up by later students. And so what I did was sort of the start and then there wasn't much more to it. Um, but it was um, inspired by um, metalloproteins. There's certain, the metalloproteins in things like lobsters and other crustaceans uh, that carry blood, it's not hemoglobin like we have with iron. Um, and it's actually a protein that has two copper atoms in it. And so the idea behind my research way back at UD a long time ago, because uh, we're talking way more than 40 years ago, um, was to try to understand these compounds by making smaller molecule models that would have the same behavior. And so the idea was to make a ring, so it's sort of an elongated molecule that had a space to bind two copper atoms in it or two other, whatever metals you wanted to put in there. Um, with the idea that if you, if you had this, this sort of robust synthetic method, you could make smaller or bigger rings to vary the distance between the two metals and you could bind a substrate in between them like an enzyme would and so what we were hoping to find was that we could reversibly bind oxygen and release it. And we didn't get there that, you know, you, you never get to where you think you're going to do. I was the first person on the project. So we were lucky to get to the point of, of the organic chemistry of making the rings and starting to study some of the complexes. Um, and there's, since there's been so little of that published since then, um, we're interested still in seeing, can we bind something between the two metals? And one of the things that was uh, most interesting to me most recently was, could we bind carbon dioxide and maybe then carry out reactions to turn carbon dioxide into something more useful? So, um, you know, that's sort of, it, it's sort of in the back burner, um, but I'd really like to make one more push on that before I retire too. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, I think what's interesting about both those, um, both those research topics is it wasn't previously done at Widener and it was really hardly even done at, you know, other universities, but because a student had an interest in it, 
all of a sudden it got carried out. And I think that's the powerful, I think that's, that's it goes to show you how powerful research can be. You know, it, I, when I talk to Dr. Bastin, when you talk to other faculty, it's really driven by the students. It's honestly driven by the students. If the students are interested in it, they will drive the research. Um, so, you know, my advice to students is if you're, if you're interested in something, or like, let's say you, you come across a question in lab or lecture, and this is also the other disciplines too, you come across something in lab, you know, your political science or psychology, and you're like, you want to learn more about that. All you got to do is go to a professor and say, hey, can we do this? Or like, how do, can we learn more about this? And nine times out of 10, they're going to say yes. So would you, would you agree with that, you think? Yeah, I do. I, you know, I think, I think the best research uh, is something that students are really interested in. Um, I looked to, back to my undergraduate research where I did it with my beloved professor, but it wasn't actually something I was very interested in. I was more interested in pleasing her. And so I didn't do all that great with it. So I, I tell students who want to do research, you know, you've got to, it's got to be something you want to be in lab doing, right? You have to be interested in it. And that doesn't mean you have to come up with the idea from ground zero, but you do need to have some sort of an interest. And if you talk to faculty members, chances are you're going to find something where your interests and their interests mesh, and you can kind of carve out a niche that will give you a really cool research project. Mm -hmm. And it's really fun because it's something nobody has done before. Yeah, and it's like your own work, and you know, you're the expert on it. You know, no one knows. And people, when people ask you questions about research, it's not because they're trying to harp you on whether or not you know, it's just because they're genuinely interested, right? You're not doing it for a grade, it's just people are just interested in your own research. So I think that's, I think that's great. As we as we begin to wrap up here, Dr. Martin, I want to ask I want to ask you something. This is something I always finish up with. What is some advice that you give to like students um, moving through transitioning from high school to college, um, specifically in chemistry? But honestly, what's some advice do you give to students in general? Oh, wow. So yeah, I'm I'm full of advice, which is you know um, sometimes I should just shut up and you know <laughs> think. But um, but yeah. So I think. Um, the first is that you, you have to not be too hard on yourself, right? Everybody is human and you may have done great in high school. College is totally different. And I'm living proof that you can start off your college experience with grades that were inconceivable in high school and still end up having a great career and, and you know doing great things, having fun. Um, so you have to not be too hard on yourself and you have to recognize that making mistakes is really part of the learning process. I can still remember a quiz I got wrong in freshman chemistry that still pisses me off today, right? Um, but I learned from it and I will never make that mistake again. And so it's really okay. And so if you don't beat yourself up too much and say, okay, I can bounce back. My brain is growing. I'm learning to do new things. I wouldn't be in college if I already knew how to do all this stuff. I wouldn't need it, right? So it's really okay to get C's. It's really okay if you have to repeat a course. I had to repeat a graduate school course because I just totally didn't get it the first time I was in there. I figured out how to be a better student. And so you will learn how to be a better student. So um, it just sort of, you have to learn a process and you have to trust yourself. And if it's something that you really don't want to do, then college gives you an opportunity to find things that you really do want to do. And you should take advantage of that. Um, and I, I think the biggest thing is you got to be true to yourself. I was too busy trying to please other people or what I thought other people wanted of me. And I, what I didn't understand at the time was what people really wanted for me was that I was happy and did things I wanted to do. And so I had it all backwards. And so um, I see that in a lot of students and it, it's really okay to advocate for yourself mm -hmm. and try to find something that really excites you because it's your life and you have to live it and you have to be open to the opportunities. That's, that's such great advice. Um, I, one more thing. I, I kind of want to dive into a little bit on your burden. Um, because okay. birding is something that you are very passionate about, something that you do um, kind of on your own time. Um, I want to I want to learn a little bit. So, what exactly is birding, um, and you know why do you why why do you enjoy it so much? Yeah, so I, I guess it's because my parents kept lists of birds they saw, and they had bird feeders, and and it was my grandfather's heritage sort of thing. So I was interested from the beginning, and every time we went on trips, we'd take binoculars and see what we could see, um, and you know, there's some people make a distinction between birding and bird watching. And I'm, I, you know, I'm a birder in the sense that I keep a list of all the birds that I see. And if I'm going to go somewhere new, I research the birds I might see there. So I'm prepared, you know, that kind of thing. Um, 
But really, it's, it's everything from just enjoying watching birds at the bird feeder and looking at their behavior and the whole kind of mir miraculous event of migration. Right now, the, the winter birds, the ones that, that bred way up in the Arctic or, or in the tundra and can or whatever, are coming down here. And all of our summer birds have gone down to South or Central America. Um, and it's just, there's something very, um, I don't know, sort of reassuring about sort of the cycle of things. And um, the birds are beautiful and they're interesting and you can find them everywhere. I found a life bird in the parking lot at Widener on the ground, a marsh bird called a Virginia rail a couple years ago. Mm. And it had gotten tired in migration and had landed in the parking lot um, and eventually got better and flew off. So, you know, you, you, you can even in the middle of Chester, you're going to find birds. And so, um, and they're everywhere. So it just, it brings me great joy and being outside is just, uh, it's just great. It seems super peaceful. Um, I never even like really kind of thought about it. Um, I mean, birds, they are crazy. They are awesome creatures, I think. I see we have, you have some owls in the background. I do. Uh, what's, what's your favorite bird? Like, do you have oh, one bird you're like? Yeah. They asked us that on a bird field trip. I go on lots of bird field trips. I'm like, oh, that's just not fair. It's like the bird I'm seeing right now. Mm -hmm. So the little guys in the back there are saw wet owls. And I got to see them being captured and banded at night um, outside of uh, Newtown Square, actually. And so I saw one up close and personal. They're just these cute little little guys. Um, peregrine falcons I have a personal attachment to because of, of my grandfather. But, I, you know, man, I just, I, I, I like owls, I think, in general, the best of all the birds. But I love any bird I'm seeing, I love. Yeah. Honestly, I didn't think you would have an answer for that because I know <laughs> it's, you it's love not owls. possible. I but, probably have seen 400 different species. I mean, wow, I've seen, I've seen whooping quit cranes in the wild. And wow. California condors, so, you know, some pretty rare birds, which is really cool. So, yeah, it's whatever bird I'm seeing now is the best one ever. Have you ever do you ever travel to, like, like I don't even know, like, South America, like the Amazon or, like, somewhere else? I have not, but I really I would love to go there with Dr. Madagascar and also to Peru, or, sorry, to Costa Rica, where they have um, an incredible diversity of birds. Actually, for mm -hmm. my sabbatical in the spring, a friend of mine and, our, and I are planning a couple week birding trip to Texas during migration. So Dude, that, I'm very excited about that. That sounds incredible. Yeah. Where's like the one spot in the world like you're gonna see the most variety of bird? Is it the Amazon? Like that's where you're gonna see like birds <gasps> everywhere? Yeah, so so South and Central America is pretty crazy. Um, mm -hmm. Texas is actually great in the US because they get some rare birds migrating up or you know, just visiting from, from the South and from the North. So they get a crazy variety down there. Um, but actually, it's pretty crazy. Delaware, tiny state. I go birding in Delaware most of the time. They've seen something like 320 different species of birds in Delaware. Wow. So because all these birds pass through in migration. So um, yeah, you can you can find them anywhere. There's lots of places on the list I'd like to go to go birding um, mm. when, when I retire. But that's yeah. incredible because, you know, in a small state like Delaware, you know, you have over 300 species. Like I can't even imagine like I can't even imagine how many there are like in the world. Like that, that is insane. There are thousands. One guy a couple of years ago did a, a big year, which is you try to see as many birds as you can a year. And he went all over the world. And I think he saw over 5,000 species in one year. So if you divide that by the number of days in the year, you can see how much he was traveling. Um, but yeah, it's, it is. There, there's, there's lots and lots. I, I could be wrong on the number, but I think it's more than 7,000 and might be more like 14,000 for all I remember. That's yeah, incredible. lots. Well, Dr. Martin, I want to thank you so much for joining in on the podcast. Thank you for sharing your experiences, um, enlightening us a bit on your research in inorganic chemistry, as well as your birding. I know I appreciate it, and I'm sure other students and faculty and you know other people alike are going to enjoy your um, thoughts as well. Oh, well, thanks so much, Aiden. And I really, I really love that you're doing these, and I've enjoyed the ones I've watched so far. So I, I please keep it up, and uh, and I know you'll find lots more interesting people to talk to. So. Yeah, no, I think I, I plan on doing this for a long time. I want to keep on bringing as many people as I can because I think hearing so many different thoughts and how people think and it's just it's what makes the world go around, right? Uh, bringing all these different opinions and thoughts. And I only do this just because I'm interested. I don't even do this for any other reason than I just want to hear from people, you know? So I'm going to keep doing it. But with that being said, that was episode four of Undiscoved Podcast. Thank you. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you like if you like the content. And we'll see you next time. Then you're left in the dust Unless I stuck by ya You're a sunflower I think your love will be too much Or you'll be left in